Hi, everybody. Welcome back uh, to the workshop on infodemics in public health emergencies. I'm Allison Arwady. I'm the commissioner at the Chicago Department of Public Health, and I have the privilege of moderating this next panel. So right before the break, we had a focus on the approaches and actions that we can take before an infodemic is in full swing. In this panel, which will last 45 minutes, we'll be hearing from a range of experts about actions that can be taken during an emergency while an infodemic is evolving. I'll just say briefly from Chicago's point of view, I've been working on outbreaks for most of my career. And I always used to teach that it's never the two C's of cases and containment that go wrong in an outbreak. It's the other two C's, whether it's a tiny foodborne outbreak, whether it's a worldwide pandemic, it's communications and coordination, in my experience, where things can go sideways. And certainly we all learned a lot about this during COVID, but I'm hopeful that in this panel and in your questions, we'll also be thinking ahead to sort of the next outbreak, the next emergency, uh, perhaps using some of the lessons from COVID, but also all the other things we work on across public health. We always, I used to teach, think about minimizing morbidity and mortality. That's the basic approach of any outbreak. But here in Chicago, we've added very explicitly, our secondary goal with that is to build and maintain community trust in our response and understanding what that can look like and how we respond to an to an to a infodemic is the focus. So as you can see, we will have uh, four really distinguished folks on. Kate Starbird, uh, representing the academic perspective uh, from the University of Washington, done a lot of really interesting work on crisis informatics, rumoring networks, how do you monitor but then act on um, in infodemic uh, dur during, during a response to make it effective and mitigate harm. We'll hear from Ann Zink, uh, bringing the state perspective, um, especially thinking about rural communities, accountability. We'll hear from Thomas Wilkinson, uh, bringing the federal agency perspective. How do you bridge public health, informatics, and national security? And then finally, Mashika Roberts um, from Columbus Public Health, uh, bringing that local perspective uh, and the practitioner information, health equity considerations. So each speaker will speak for five minutes, and then we'll come back for question and answers. Please do look at the links to the bios online and put your questions uh, directly under the Q&A, uh, right under the window. Put your questions in Q&A and we'll have time at the end. And with that, uh, it's my privilege to hand it over to Kate Starbird from the University of Washington. All right, thank you. And I think I have slides, but someone else is going to run them. Excellent. That's perfect. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, and uh, Allison, that was a great introduction. I, um, I'm from the University of Washington. I'm also right now the director of the Center for an Informed Public there, where we do research, outreach, education, and policy around strategic misinformation, and especially in online environments. I do come from the crisis informatics space. I came of age learning how to study um, uh, how people respond to crisis events on social media, um, both like the uh, the behaviors that happen on social media and also what social media can reveal about um, a crisis event as it's unfolding. Um, my work sort of shifted about 10 years ago and very specifically after the Boston Marathon bombings um, where we realized that myths and disinformation were becoming a larger part of the social media information space during those during crisis events. And we became sort of focused on that phenomenon. These slides are based in this kind of talk here is based on a recent article that my colleague Emma Spear and I published in the issues of in Science and Technology magazine, um, where we're kind of arguing um, that we've gone into some other terminology and things, but we're going to argue a little bit for a return to the idea of rumoring, and I'll explain that. Next slide. So just to um, we all know this, but in the last 10 years, online rumors, misinformation, disinformation have become an increasingly salient dimension of crisis events. And why does it matter? Well, it makes us more vulnerable during times when we need quality information to make time and safety critical decisions. Uh, and this is both um, accidental misinformation that, that, that is, that's out there and also intentional manipulation. This is my one slide that references COVID. I'm not going to explain it, but this is a network that was developing around spreading misinformation around COVID vaccines across different communities uh, in, uh, in, in early 2020. Um, next slide, please. 
So there's certain challenges for crisis responders about about this. And um, one of those is just the the information speed and overload that are happening in these online environments is making it challenging for crisis responders to to react to mis and disinformation during events. We also have a problem of increasingly there's diverse platforms. So where does your attention across all these different social media platforms if you want to be reactive and reacting in those spaces? Um, we have new gatekeepers of, of information, including a whole group of online influencers who have different kinds of motivations and um, who are, are where people turn for information during these crisis events and participatory audiences. As well, we have diminished trust and this question of when and and whether to correct that just we keep coming back to and I really want to have a chance to talk about in, in this panel. Next slide. So we have all of these terms that we've been introduced to um, different um, in, the, in the last few years. We're using the term infodemic here, uh, and, but these terms and definitions are dynamic and researchers are still trying to find the right language to describe what we're seeing and differentiate between different kinds of phenomenon. And like everything else in this space, the terms and definitions are also adversarial. We're seeing the people and organizations who benefit from some of these toxicities repeatedly attempt to co-op, corrupt, and even invert the meaning of some of these terms in part to make it more more difficult to deal with the challenges that we face. Next slide. One of the things that we've uh, noticed is that um, uh, we've been in, uh, reorienting our, our work around an old term, and that is and that is rumor. Next slide. You all know these uh, definitions of mis and disinformation. Misinformation is information that's false, but not necessarily intentionally false. Disinformation is false or misleading information, purposefully seeded or spread for a specific objective, whether financial or political. Next slide. Um, but our work has really gone back to this term of, of rumors. There's actually a lot, some of these other terms are emergent. There's a long history of study of rumors at, uh, with a surge of research in, in World War II uh, and, and afterwards. Often that, that works uh, kind of focused on rumor control, but later scholars push back on that control element and really noticed, noted the, that rumors spread in, in the absence of, of trusted official information. So rumors in, in this in this. Uh, definition are um, unofficial or unverified information that's transmitted transmitted through informal networks. They tend to proliferate in situations where there's a lack of trust, trusted official information. Um, they also can emerge as a byproduct of a natural collective sense-making process that happens as people come together to try to resolve ambiguity and uncertainty. I think we don't necessarily need to problematize rumor right away. That's part of how people deal with emotionally, psychologically, and socially um, deal with, with crisis events. As well, rumors can turn out to be true or false or somewhere in between. And so um, they don't necessarily have instantly the stigma of being being wrong. Um, and rumors, in some cases, we can think about rumors as people seeking the truth uh, as opposed to taking off from the truth, even though they don't always get there. Next slide. Rumors have a relationship to, to, to misinformation, disinformation, um, false rumors or misinformation. Disinformation campaigns can intentionally seed rumors or strategically amplify emergent rumors in, in audiences. So they're, they're not unrelated, um, but we think the rumoring frame is really val valuable. Next slide. And why do we think it's valuable? Well, um, we've been trying to work in, in a rapid response conditions ourselves as researchers. And we realized that um, when you're working in conditions of uh, uncertainty, um, you don't yet know what the intent or the veracity of a piece of information is, and you already need to start responding to it. So calling it misinformation or disinformation can be really problematic. And so kind of orienting around this idea that it's, it's rumors can actually prevent a mistake and, and hopefully preserve trust. As well, this, um, this, this approach of rumors accepts that rumors can actually be informative. There's something we can learn from them. Maybe there are bits of truth that are within those rumors. At the very least, we can learn what some of the fears of different populations are, what some of their misunderstandings and concerns are. And so we use, if you use rumor, you can position the audience as potentially contributing to situational awareness. You give them agency in the response. And hopefully in this time, um, you can build trust. Now, I understand this is, you know, we don't want to uh, give attention to conspiracy theories and all those other kinds of things. But I, I do think at this moment, a little bit of shift in terminology could be ben beneficial, especially in this adversarial environment. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to have time to go into this, but I want to talk about this framework that we've been tr sort of developing to try to help us um, respond taking this rumoring idea and applying it to a framework um, to assess 
whether a specific rumor might go viral and determine whether or not we should correct it or not. We have this huge, we want to correct it and give extra exposure or not. Um, so we pre presented this framework. Next slide. Again, I'm not going to talk you through it all. I can share this later. Um, but it's a 10 part framework that you can kind of go through to either an event that's happening to see if you're going to be vulnerable to rumors or a particular rumor to see if that rumor might go viral. And it's drawn from all the research, the historical research on rumoring, as well as our what we're learning about online environments. And you can kind of make a determination across these different things to see whether or not um, you should respond. So can you go to next slide twice? One more. Um, in this case, uh, we're looking at um, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and the event and whether or not it would spawn rumors. There's like high uncertainty. There was, you know, sort of diminished trust, real impact on the people's lives there that were that were being affected. Um, uh, similar to some events that had happened in the past, the evidence that people could collect about what was happening to them was very compelling. Pictures of oil covered beaches, oil color covered wildlife. High emotional, uh, very high emotional valence. Valence. People were very concerned and sad, um, and there were these continuous impacts that could be redistributed and, and spun both into to, to to true rumors and then also false conspiracy theories about impacts. And then we could see that social media um, was being used. So I don't want to go much longer, but um, we have this framework. I'm happy to share it and talk about it. Um, but the takeaways that I really want to talk about today are just that um, these online environments are increasingly wired to, to spread false, misleading, unsubstantiated content. A uh, return to rumoring perspective, I think, could be really beneficial for um, crisis communicators as they try to rebuild trust. And that I'm happy to, to talk about sort of this framework that we're trying to use to help guide people on in the moment on whether or not to respond to spe specific rumors. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for getting us started. I think one thing everybody who has been part of this in the last few years knows that people are never going to ask the questions you think they're going to ask, and they're going to come from rumors from different groups and populations, and I appreciate you setting up that framework of response for us. We'll turn it over um, next to Ann Zink uh, from the Alaska Department of Public Health. Great. Thanks so much, Allison. And Kate, thanks for a wonderful introduction on such an important topic. Allison, I love that you've included it in your mission because I think those of us in local and state public health know that it is critical to all of the work that we do. So as a state public health official, I'm the chief medical officer for the state of Alaska, and I'm also the ASTA president association for state and territorial health officers. It's very much that practice of public health. How can we take the information and brilliance that Kate and team provide to the information and balance that with the political nature in which we work, as well as with our state and local uh, entities to be able to translate that? Everyone wants to see the me within the we of data. They want to see themselves represented in that space. And without that, we have mistrust and distrust in that space. And so how do we take our public health actions? How do we make it individualized? You know, I loved Kate's comment earlier about to correct or not to correct. And I oftentimes say, instead of that question, can we also say, what do we do to connect? And so how do we connect to the people we serve rather than correcting or not connecting? And that's where we really tried to shift a lot of our messaging from the public health department. And how can we think about that um, instead of an authoritarian uh, way? How can we have authority without being authoritarian in the messaging that we're able uh, to share? Dr. Lewinsky shared a great little story the other day when I was at another conference, Allison was there, but she said, you know, your head might be in the oven and your feet might be in the freezer and your average temperature might be just fine, but you're experiencing that differently. And I think we need to think about what that individual experience looks like and put that into context when we're sharing information, because maybe that person's in the fire or maybe that person's in the freezer, but what we're saying is all average and it's fine. And so really, uh, how do we make sure we share that we within the me of data? The other thing that I would highlight in this space is trust is built on communication as well as accountability. And so what ways can we be as accountable as possible in the information we share? And what ways can we be as clear in our communication uh, so that people can be able to see that information uh, and build that trust in information? As we move into this next phase, thinking about information, much like we think about a virus, I think is gonna be incredibly important. And that's why it's great to have Kate and team and so many others thinking about the way that information spreads and shares. I think of it much like a virus. Uh, you know, Twitter has a different R not value than my health action alerts that my epi team sends on. Those R not values are not that great in getting around. But then also, just like we can vaccinate people against uh, diseases, and then chronic diseases makes people more likely to be impacted to COVID, chronic mistrust in the healthcare system and chronic mistrust in public health 
makes people more vulnerable to this information. And so what are the vaccines that we can use and how do we build that chronic health framework or that chronic information framework so that people are more resistant uh, to information or misinformation or disinformation when it gets there and more receptive uh, to information that's going to make them more healthy. So how do we build those connections now uh, in this time so that when the health team uh, shares additional information, they're set and ready to move uh, in that space. I would also like to challenge us all to think about the information that we're sharing, not just in terms of problems. You know, we talk a lot about uh, smoking uh, risk. We talk about public health risk. We saw a lot recently about, you know, oh, public health is just all about fear. Um, and I think we do need to shift to making sure that we're talking about protective factors uh, and what ways we can build those protective factors. So not just what uh, is misinformation or disinformation, but how do we build back vaccine competency? How do we build health competency? How do we build health uh, literature and information? I uh, had been known during the pandemic to say if I could have any one thing during the pandemic, it was that people had a better understanding of denominators. It can be really challenging to express information without a really strong science background. And I think as public health officials, we'd owe it to support our teachers uh, and to say, like, this is this is information and this is these are denominators, these are numerators, and this is how you can interpret this information um, when it comes out. So I think we need to be looking through the entire continuum from what we're teaching our kiddos in science and education so they can be critical thinkers uh, all the way through what we're sharing uh, with our public health information at the end of the day. As we continue to shift, um, I also would really challenge public health to be thinking of themselves as shared decision makers with their partners, uh, rather than, again, the uh, final uh, end all be all. You know, and again, to Kate's comment a little bit about like rumoring, being able to express our uncertainty when we have it. Um, my background is a emergency medicine physician. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm not there to tell someone if they should or shouldn't continue uh, aggressive treatment for their cancer, but I'm there to sit beside them and share my medical knowledge with them and partner with them to figure out what's going to make the best sense for them. And that's true with our community partners on if they're going to mask or if they're not going to mask or what they're going to do in their school or how they're going to respond to a chicken brox outbreak. Um, and how can we sit with them to understand kind of their local um, their local situation, their own experience, and being able to partner. And that's, it's incredibly hard at a national level. It's incredibly hard at a state level. It's incredibly hard at a local level. Um, but I think that we do have tools that can uh, continue to be um, localized and individualized so that we can do shared decision making. And even in the words that we're putting out, making sure that we're doing it in a way that emphasizes the shared decision making instead of in a very authoritarian and the last thing I wanted to emphasize is just the importance of that final mile. Um, our federal government can come up with great ideas, um, but if it doesn't get through at that final mile, it's not going to happen. And ultimately, at the end of the day, public health, just like politics, has to do with people. And it's their individual experiences and what comes out to that individual person that is going to be success or not success. And that's where our partnership with our local public health departments, our CBOs, our other trusted messengers, be it you know, a church or a religious affiliation or a local school district are going to be as important as anything else. I'd oftentimes joke in the state of Alaska, I have the authority to Zoom and that's about it. Um, but, you know, it's a really powerful tool to be able to have two-way communication with your local entities uh, to hear their concerns uh, and values, bring others with you and be able to move forward. And there can be a lot that you can do with your power to Zoom. Yeah, and I think that we need to embrace our ability to communicate um, more aggressively to be able to meet with our local entities, local partners, uh, to be able to address health information moving forward. So thanks for the opportunity on this panel. I'll turn it back over. Uh, thanks so much, Anne. Um, so much to unpack in there. Uh, I do think one of the positives that has come from these last few years is that Many more people in the U.S. know the term epidemiology, have become sort of armchair data scientists, for better or for worse, have gotten much better at at least looking at the data and then wanting to think about how to use it, in some cases, to drive a particular perspective. But I think this, th this interest kind of in that data and in the denominators at some level um, in the general public and the media is, is a piece that doesn't often get talked about and so much more to talk about in there. So let's go next uh, to Thomas Wilkinson uh, from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, really, this this also thinking about uh, infodemics, but especially about how health informatics and health security can come together at that federal level. Thank you, Allison, and thanks for inviting me to participate today. And thank you, Anne, for setting up pretty much everything I wanted to say. <laughs> so, um, uh, first, my first task uh, has to be a disclaimer, as everybody understands the federal disclaimer is that what I'm about to say is my own opinion and is not representative of the Department of Homeland Security or the U.S. federal government. Um, 
the next thing I want to mention is that although this segment of, of today's many interesting talks is really focused on response to, uh, to the epidemic, um, it is hard for me to separate um, response from uh, a, a uh, anticipatory posture, so preparedness. And I, I have three main points I'd like to make, and you'll see that they, they are uh, folded together with kind of that anticipatory posture and, and then the response that would, that would use that posture. Um, first thing I would mention, and Allison, you led me to it, is that uh, an epidemic, a public health epidemic, is a, is a national concern national security concern. Um, we, have, uh, we have studies that measured the number of people who died post availability of the COVID vaccine. And even if some large proportion of those people were, uh, had, had, uh, had their own reasons for not taking the vaccination, the, uh, the truth is that a considerable number of those people may have needlessly died due to misunderstanding of what the vaccine would do or or or, or where it came from or what the um, what the intention was with the vaccine so uh the three points i want to make is uh first health begins and ends with community it is where not only all the authorities lie with the with the local public health office uh but it's also where all of the relationships are. And if there has been a recurring theme across the entire morning, it was, and, and thus far this afternoon, it's all about relationships and trust. Um, so uh, we at the federal level do not have strong enough connections to those local communities. Uh, as, a, as an example, uh, um, it is so much easier for us to contract with a Walgreens or a CBS to get vaccines pushed out to the public than it is for us to contact with tens of thousands of primary care practices. But those primary care practices are where the longitudinal relationships happen. That's where it's that's where the trust starts. And that's where the opportunity to insert ourselves sideways into groups that may have um, in, in an echo chamber kind of way have, have spun up against you know worries about what the what the public health initiative is all about we have an opportunity with trusted relationship that is local and on the ground to be uh to be basically the uh conveyors of of the communication that connection between the, between local communities and the federal government is uh is tenuous at best and it needs to be a fire hydrant. It needs to be huge, and the, and it shouldn't be uh, fire hydrant aimed at the federal government. It should be the other way around. The uh, all the activities have to be forward deployed. The federal government should really be uh, the, the supporting task, and not the um, uh, and and in support of adding resources, whether it's uh, intellectual resources or whether it is uh, funding or staffing resources. But resources to the uh, otherwise resource strapped local communities. Our second point is uh, we have to check scientific hubris. Uh, it is the source of most, much distrust. Uh, and it isn't, so I have, I have dear pediatrician colleagues who will refuse to take a patient if the mom doesn't want to vaccinate their children. We need to be careful because we are getting ready to add a new marginalized community, which is anti-science community or or science or, or or at least distrustful science community. People who are unsure, and if we keep closing the door and saying this is just you know you just you just don't understand or you just aren't smart enough to understand, it is uh, it, it's. It is emblematic of hubris, and hubris is is a um, it is inconsistent with listening. And if anything is necessary in building trust, it has to be listening. So, um, what I uh, with regard to hubris, what I want to 
what I think we should do in the context of an epidemic. I think we need to be clear about what we know and what we don't know. Uh, and too often, we simply push a, a message, and the message is not always um, uh, consistent from one week to the next. And I think it, we can mitigate that inconsistency by just augmenting the message with clarity around what we don't know, what we're hoping to know soon. I think that secondly, and this is an important piece, we also have to get our own house in order. Scientists, public health officials, doctors are just as vulnerable to misinformation as anybody else. And this doesn't have to be uh, you know, popular or, or, um, uh, or uh, the kind of misinformation that, that, uh, that may be just conspiratorial. This can be scientific misinformation, misunderstanding the, the, the applicability of the study, misunderstanding the validity, the external validity of the study. All those things can be versions of misinformation can mislead our scientists. And we need to be able to, I mean, this goes back to what Ian was talking about earlier. We need to be able to build a bit of an information commons where we all agree this is at least the facts. And, uh, and those facts are at least where the science can start from. Uh, as we talked about in the morning, it's possible to take those same facts and derive different policy from it, but at least we have to have an information commons. Otherwise, we will never reach those communities through our local practitioners because they may be just, you know, just listening to the wrong information as well. And third and final point, which is, I think, one of the most important I can make, is that the cycle of panic and neglect are contrary to national security. We, we, neither one is helpful to national security, neither panic nor neglect. So we need to be thinking about funding, and this is a national security imperative. Not, I'm not talking about public health funding. I'm not talking to HHS. I'm talking to my own folks in DHS. I'm saying we need to fund the interstices between crises because that is how you prepare for crisis. You can't, it, it's, you can't just stand up during the crisis and then when you go away, you've lost not only all that infrastructure, all those trusted relationships, all that bonding that just finished, that just happened. Not only do you lose all of that, but you lose reliability and reliability is a proxy for trust. You leave, what happens then? Well, you know, the person's not here anymore. It's hard to trust them. So I think this is something that uh, we need to think about carefully at, at the federal level. I think that the, the um, federal funding needs to be much more operationally oriented. It is important nationally to have infrastructure and, and to make sure that federal agencies are well configured to do their jobs, to do their missions. But I think we spend more money on federal initiatives than we do on local uh, public health initiatives, and I think that's a, a mistake. And and in the in the context of national security operations, is where the emphasis needs to be. Funding and resources need to be forward facing. And uh, I'll turn it back to you, Allison. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Thomas. Lots in there too. I think you know this this piece of at least in Chicago, you know, we're facing almost a 70% drop in our budget between the year 2022 and projected in 2025 again. And where you think about how much we've built and you want to be prepared and you want to have these communications and you want to build trust when you've built work in communities that then by definition, you're going to have to pull back because the funding's gone. I think you are, you know, th there's that important piece. And I think we don't talk about that enough. And I appreciate uh, you raising that. So let's turn it over finally, uh, given that you're especially highlighting this local piece uh, to Mashika Roberts uh, from the Columbus Department of Public Health. Thank you, Allison, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I thank all of my panelists um, joining me, and I echo uh, most of their sentiments. So as Allison said, I'm going to really try to explain how this has impacted us from a local health department. For those of you who are not aware, Columbus, Ohio is the 14th largest city in the United States with a population of about 900,000 individuals. And if you take the whole metropolitan area, we're at about 1.3 million, so pretty large. 
And as you know, and as we've heard already this afternoon, infodemics, infodemics present unique challenges to our public health work, and they have the potential to make an emergency worse and much more difficult to manage. Myths and disinformation distracts us from our critical work that we must do to protect the health and safety of the residents and communities we serve. This noise that's created from epidemic seeds distrust in public health, and it makes it harder for people, our residents, to access reliable sources, information, and guidance when they need it the most. While myths and disinformation is nothing new, we all know that. The infodemic created during the COVID-19 pandemic reached epic proportions, and it is like nothing else that I've ever seen in my professional life or my lifetime. So we live in a time when one false fact can amplify within minutes and spread all around the world before we even have a chance to respond, thanks to social media. The infodemic accelerated and perpetuated misinformation, particularly as it was related to COVID-19 vaccines. This resulted in vaccine hesitancy and mistrust, especially among our marginalized people who were most at risk for adverse outcomes and severe consequences. But the COVID-19 epidemic was just the beginning. So right here in Columbus, we recently had the largest U.S. outbreak of measles in 2022. It's the fifth largest outbreak of measles that the United States has seen. It affected 85 children, most of whom were old enough to get the MMR vaccine, but their parents had decided not to get them vaccinated with the MMR vaccine. While talking to parents of some of our very sick children in that outbreak, nearly all of them said it was because of the misbelief that the MMR vaccine causes autism. This is an old discredited story, and the firestorm it created has caused an epidemic around safe and effective vaccines that protect children. And this has been going on now for over 20 years. And this epidemic had caused 36 children to be so sick that they needed to be in the hospital. These 36 children were children of parents who chose not to vaccinate their children with the MMR vaccine in a timely fashion because they were concerned about the connection with the MMR vaccine and autism. While the COVID-19 pandemic and our measles outbreak are just two examples, here at Columbus Public Health, we've used some of these same tools for combating this epidemic. In both cases, both measles and COVID, we continue to push out timely and accurate and easy to understand advice and information via traditional media, social media, as well as non-traditional channels. So we focus on a few key areas that I wanna share with you. First of all, transparency. We learned very early in the COVID-19 pandemic that we had to be transparent and share with the public what we knew about COVID-19, not only about the virus, but about what our case volume was, our hospitalization was, what our ethnic and minority breakdown was. So we put up dashboards that we would um, update on a daily basis on our website that anyone could have access to, assuming they had access to the internet. And we did that same thing when it came to MPOX, when MPOX became a thing, and when it came to our measles outbreak, we did the same thing. And our residents, our partners found that very helpful, very useful, and our media relied on it. We also had time, we really looked at the timing and frequency of the messages. Um, we know that if you overload people with too much information, they'll turn off. So we were very clear about how timely that information came out, and we wanted to keep a steady drumbeat of that information. We also used targeted messages, and not just, you know, basic demographics like race and ethnicity and age, but also zip codes, um, neighborhoods, what channels we were using, particularly cultural media. Um, for some of our outbreaks, that was really important. We understand that not one size fits all, and so um, that approach proved very beneficial for us for both um, COVID, MPOX, as well as our measles outbreak. And then it was important to think about how the messages were delivered and who delivered the messages. So we knew it was important to go to those communities who were most impacted, go to their neighborhood centers and talk to them. Don't just rely on media, social media, but be there in person. And then who the messages are, who the messengers are. Um, we relied on trusted messengers, faith leaders, parents, business leaders, influencers, many social media influencers. And so that was really instrumental for us to be successful. 
And then how do we amplify that message? How do we get other people to pass it on and repeat that message with our community partners? Um, and we have great relationships with our community partners, whether they be CBOs or um, cultural groups to really help us amplify those messages. And then to think about after the emergency is over, how do you continue to maintain those relationships and not just be there for the emergency, but even once it has passed, to keep that relationship going so that you can rely on it, not just for that urgent issue, but for some of those chronic issues as well. So that's how we did things here in Columbus. Um, but, it, you know, it's a real thing and it really does fall on the local health departments or the state. But usually it's the locals who have that relationship with the community and really know how to engage them and have to make sure that there's trust and going in both directions. So I think I'm going to stop there. And Allison, I'm going to pass it back to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Mashika. I think it's always helpful to bring it. Thanks for bringing up the measles example, um, where there are constantly right. This is these are things that at every level, um, perhaps it's not rising to the level of a pandemic, but how do we get 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 better at this? How do we get better at this at every level during a response? There's so many ways we could take this conversation, um, but just because I want to pull everybody back in, I think I want to focus a little bit actually on, on speed. Um, so Kate, you had set us up with this framework around rumors and that there's ways to sort of break that apart and think about which are uh, you know, which are the ones that may be most dangerous? How do we respond to that? And then, Anne, you sort of said, you know, it's not just about correcting those rumors, it's about making those connections sort of with community. Uh, I thought Thomas brought up this really interesting point about you've got a marginalized population of people who aren't with you, who perhaps are more mistrustful of that science. And then, Mashika, you're talking about how do we make sure we're using messengers that, that, that can speak to the community, that you're building that over time. And all of these, I'm interested in hearing you reflect about how do you do these things quickly when an emergency uh, evolves? Um, are there particular standards that we should be thinking about doing routinely, whether it's a health department or another agency, sort of right off the bat? Because it doesn't take very long to Mashika's last comment for, you know, one piece of information to really start moving. So I'd love to just open that up. Maybe, Kate, we'll start back with you, just because we heard from you um, right up at the beginning. But I'd love to just hear you reflect on that. Um, the, the, some of the, what you were talking about, speed, and if there's specific things that you think uh, agencies should be doing right off the bat um, as an emergency or potential emergency is 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 uh, emerging. Yeah, I mean, being reactive is is going to never be fast enough for the speed of, of of misinformation, and we know that the corrections never catch up to the distance that the that the falsehoods spread. So, um, one of the things we've been recommending, and it's something that's sort of um, the research is still working on, but it's almost a pre-bunking. Uh, and, and that is, you know, you've got an event happening and you can anticipate, we know with the next, uh, the next vaccine, we know that there's going to be resistance to it. And so as we think about an event unfolding, we know with the, the, the train, the train derailment that there was going to be concerns about health impacts and some would be true and some would, some would be um, probably not true. And so um, you can anticipate those things as an event is, is unfolding. And even maybe before event, Kind of go through and anticipate and and almost like preset pre craft uh, resources that you can put out into the world quickly if you need to. And again, um, this idea that 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 you may not be the right communicators, but you need to get you're the one who has the information. So you've got to get the facts out there in a format that others can use to pick up and and help spread your message and help correct. And so I kind of think about this right now as sort of like as a communicator, you're seeding the space with the good information, uh, with the the hopes uh, and hopefully some of the connections that um, these the other new gatekeepers of information can use to, to help correct and, and get that information out there. Um, but in order to see that space, sometimes I think maybe thinking about a pre-bunking strategy uh, to get information out in advance or at least get it crafted in advance as we learn what to expect with some emergent events. Great. Anne, what do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I guess there's kind of four tactical things that we've kind of taken on, you know, for kind of concrete. One is I think responding as quickly as possible with compassion, even if you don't know. So like our social media team, as soon as there was even a really nasty misinformation or disinformation or even personally attacking information, 
we might say something like, you know, appreciate your, your comments or we, you know, I hear you that it's really frustrating to get healthcare and you don't, you know, how can we, we want to make sure we direct you to our public health echo where we have like two-way conversation with every single, like we had echoes with our population every single week where people could ask two-way questions. It was incredibly moderated to try to make sure that we could get through it and that it was polite and, and uh, feasible, but we had an avenue to directly uh, link people in. So responding with compassion and a follow-up resource that they can do, even if you don't have a direct answer or even if what they're sharing uh, to really just consistently show that compassion. Two, um, preparing like a group response for an individual. So, you know, a big measles outbreak that we had a few years ago, and the same thing happened with COVID. If we have something in the community, our first immediate response is who's the state health official, who's the local entity, who's the local healthcare provider, and then often who's the municipality or tribal leader as well, because they're oftentimes very involved. And so we kind of had a set checklist of people that we get involved. We'd immediately jump. Alaska is very dependent on radio as a form of communication in many of our communities. And we would do a Zoom call that was then produced on radio that then could be linked to Facebook and other social media. And then we would really turn it over to the local entities to be able to have that information and, and say, you know, we really trust and respect your mayor or your city council or your tribal leader or your local health department. And we're here to support them. And then we as a state could like then back out and really led that. But then everyone was hearing from all of us at once at the very beginning, even if we had no additional information, except for we have a case or we have a concern about X, Y, or Z. And here's where you want to get information from. The third thing that I would say is two-way town hall communication. Even if you think it's the most um, <laughs> fruitless uh, information that you may, there was uh, one community incredibly resistant to most information. In fact, uh, the senator from that region recently told me, you know, I really appreciate you all talking to me, even though I never followed any of your information. I was like, okay, I'm going to take that as a win, right? Like he may not have followed it, but we're still having open dialogue. And what we found is even though sometimes those town halls were very contentious, there was a lot of anger, there was a lot of tension, when we would show up a week later to do kind of these weekly vaccine uh, rollouts that we would do, our numbers would skyrocket after those. So there were a lot of people listening in the background that may not have been the loud vocal voices, but by showing up with compassion, consistency, even when it doesn't feel like that's being reciprocated, there's a lot of quiet people listening and continuing to, my husband always said, show up for the climb, show up for the challenge, show up with compassion, show up with grace. Uh, and you never know who's listening in the background. And I think that consistency can, can help. And then the last thing I would just mention, and Kate mentioned this briefly, is pre-written information that you're ready to go. You know, when the Wuhan flight came through Alaska, you know, we prepared three press releases. Like, this was a complete disaster. This went okay, or this went really well. And it was really relieving to pull out, like, plan A, like, this went really well. But we were prepared with three different press releases, and we had talked through as a team how that was going to be able to message so that when suddenly you're doing a press conference at 2 a.m. after not sleeping for three days, you're ready to do it based on what that looks like. So if you have got time, as Kate had mentioned, to prepare some of that information, particularly for those big ones, you'll be able to just uh, flow with it. So those are kind of four takeaways that um, on communication. Excellent. Uh, Thomas. Uh, you can call me Tom. Um, Tom. So, so um, it is hard for me to talk uh, Kate Mann, that both of them hit pretty much everything that I would want to say. But the thing that I would add is, from a federal perspective, the thing that I would want to do is to reach out to them. So again, thinking in terms of the forward deployment of, of resources, it isn't that I need to be the one speaking. I just need to know what they need. So I can't, from, from my chair in Washington, the little Washington, it's, it's, it's the city. Um, from my from my chair in Washington, I can't understand what their what the need is. I don't under I I, I can't presume to understand. So yes, I, I can have pre-prepared materials and yes, I can have uh, some sense of what I need to do, how I need to inform leadership and beyond. Uh, but uh, but my first job is probably just to to reach out to people who uh, whom I know who are who are boots on the ground and understand the position and then yeah, what they said. All right, perfect. And then Mashika, finish us off. Sorry about that, trying to find my mute button. Um, yeah, so I would just say it, it, how important it is to really individualize your response to every community. And I, I think about during the pandemic, um, really working with our African-American community versus our Latino community. And what we heard loud and clear from them is they didn't need these big messages. They wanted more one-on-one um, -on -one conversations to kind of get counseled individually based on their needs, their health needs. And so what we did for them was we held 
vaccine clinics in neighborhoods that they felt comfortable with going at locations they felt comfortable going at going to but we put health educators there so that they could go and ask questions before they went and got the vaccine and not just feel like it was hurry up get your vaccine and get out of here but there was someone there who was just there to talk to them and answer questions and we saw that again during impox again different population largely lgbtq population and their needs were very different than what we had experienced during the pandemic with some of our marginalized communities or other marginalized communities so just really understanding that population and what their needs are and tailoring your response to help that population and meeting them where they are all right, great. Um, so really, we could talk about this for hours and hours. I very much appreciated Mashika, Ann, Tom, Kate, everybody's different perspectives, but so many of the strands that really run through this. Um, I think we've learned a lot uh, during a time of emergency these last few years. Um, and my hope is that if you've been listening in, you've heard pieces here that you could take and use, whether it's thinking about how we use even the word rumor, how we think about bringing compassion, how we think about the people who are being left out. Uh, and perhaps they're being left out because they are not right off the bat as as likely uh, to follow along with the official messaging. How do you adapt to that? How do you bring it local? How do you use trusted messengers? Uh, there's so much more we, we could talk about with this group, um, but I would encourage you, if, if you heard something that really interested you, reach out to the individuals who were on the panel uh, just now. Um, I'm gonna go back and listen to it again, just because I feel like there were a lot of good takeaways in these last 45 minutes. Um, so we don't have time for more with this group, but I'm really pleased to pass it off to the next panel. Um, Elena Savoya is going to now be having a panel that builds on this, the systems, capacities, responsibilities, and partnerships for infodemic preparedness and response. And that's so much of what we heard about. Thanks again to the panel, and thanks again uh, to everybody at, at NASM for uh, really having this important conversation.